very special speaker as the next in the series. This call is now being recorded. I would like to invite our director, Professor K.M. Siti, to welcome us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes. Uh, welcome you all. I welcome, uh, first of all, Dr. Maria Karistro, faculty at the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, UK, uh, who is a specialist in uh, rivers and waters, I understand, from her profile. She has done a lot of work on uh, uh, ecology, uh, human ecology, uh, eco-perspectives, a lot of things. Uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Matthew Varghese for uh, uh, enabling us to uh, listen to this lecture by Maria Caristo. This is uh, the second uh, lecture in the series uh, with a focus on engaging with ecologies. Last week, we had a scholar from South Africa who spoke on the uh, water issues in South Africa, a very insightful lecture by uh, a South African scholar. Um, this lecture is specifically dealing with uh, liquid, liquid linear places uh, with a specific focus on rivers and canals in the United Kingdom. A very interesting uh, subject uh, because uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, common things uh, uh, from the point of view of Kerala and the United States. Uh, in Kerala also we have about uh, 44 rivers. We have about uh, more than 3,000 uh, kilometers of uh, rivers. Um, from the point of view of uh, micro watersheds, we have more than 4,400 uh, kilometers of micro watersheds. And we have also uh, in Kerala about uh, five, 1,500 kilometers of backwaters of canal. Um, interestingly, uh, Kerala is also uh, blessed with this, uh, what we call as uh, a kind of an environment, uh, uh, which is uh, very uh, sensitive uh, as well, but a very uh, a different one and compared to the other states in India. So a small state, uh, which is uh, almost half of the population of the United, United Kingdom. I think uh, you must be knowing that the US, UK population is uh, roughly uh, less than uh, seven crores, mean, means uh, 70 million. We have in Kerala about 35 million people, um, a small state in India, but uh, uh, very happy that they were endowed with this natural beauty and other things like that. But uh, there are several things that we have to discuss in the context of our experience. You know, in 19, 2018 and 2019, the state of Kerala was hard hit by floods. And uh, at that point of view, many of us uh, were thinking about how, how the, the water management, so-called uh, what we call as uh, water governance in Kerala, the way we handle uh, water issues in Kerala, that would have led to uh, the disaster in Kerala in 2018 and 2019, like that. I'm not uh, talking about the the specificity of Kerala, but uh, we may have to think about whether we have to draw some lessons from United Kingdom, how they are managing these uh, canals and waters in the context of uh, the very rich uh, natural endowments in United Kingdom, um, and also. Uh, there are several interesting insights that uh, we have to uh, discuss. So for example, uh, water is not uh, kind of a, a materiality, but it is also a kind of a social reality. Uh, there is a social dimension, eco-social dimension. We may call it is it even an ethnographic dimension of uh, the water management in different parts of the world. I'm sure that in the coming years, uh, uh, water management could be an even very interesting and a very important subject of uh, studies across this world, particularly in the background of these uh, issues of climate change and like that. So from that point of view, though uh, Maria is speaking on the issues from or the, the, the what we call as uh, the 
the liquid linear uh, issues from the experience of the United Kingdom, you may have to draw a lot of lessons, uh, even uh, from the point of view of the experiences of Kerala, a small state in India and like that. That's why that this lecture is very important that these engagements with ecology series is specifically um, uh, envisaged in this context of drawing experiences from other parts of the world. So let us not uh, uh, consider this lecture as uh, not related to Kerala or India as such. It is very much a part of the issues that the people in the United Kingdom or elsewhere are addressing. So I welcome uh, each and everyone uh, in this particular session. I welcome uh, uh, to Maria once again on behalf of uh, this, uh, the Inter-University Center for Social Sciences, Mahatma Gandhi University. I, uh, I would uh, uh, request uh, Dr. Matthew Varghis to, to conduct the proceedings as we have been doing it uh, in the last uh, several lectures. Dr. Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor C.P., for uh, continuous encouragement in this uh, venture of engaging with ecology. And I'm sure with this encouragement, we'll go forward. A short word on Maria. Um, we met at a very interesting panel. And that panel was very much a design of Maria and Francesco, uh, uh, academic colleague from Venice. Uh, this was called Changing Tracks and Tracking Changes, Social Lives of Rivers and Canals. And uh, that was during a uh, SIEF, International Society for Ethnology and Folklore meeting, which took place in Northwest Autonomous Region of Spain, called Galicia. There were lots of extrapolations from there into hybridities in the making, the results of environmental processes, a variety of human and non-human agencies in interaction, transport, dwelling, and the interactives have been uh, gladly continuing and here we have uh, Maria sharing her research and the process of inquiry with us um, to liquid linear places, rivers and canals in the UK. Before we start, let me just remind all of our participants that uh, we will keep our audio, our video and the present button closed. Uh, we will keep uh, the audio, video, and the present button closed. And after the interactions, we are really looking forward for an interactive to the chat box that we have. And in the chat box, please type in your, your queries as they come by during the process or after the process. And we will quote you and read the query for Maria after the presentation. So with that, let me uh, welcome Maria Caristo the next in the series. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, and thank you very much, Dr. Sisi, for this very kind uh, invitation to, to give this talk. I hope you hear me all right. Very much, yes, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, I will, I will uh, start uh, straight from the start. Um, this talk uh, will focus on the rivers and canals in the in the UK, and I would like to share with you uh, some of the research that I have been um, conducting uh, uh, on the UK inland waterways uh, since uh, 2014. So even though um, uh, many of you might already be um, uh, familiar with the history of the of the UK canals and rivers, uh, I think it would still be useful to give um, a short uh, historical overview of the of the canal history and uh, and development. Uh, I will then um, introduce my my data and uh, and the field work, uh, how I uh, collected this data. Um, my research is mostly uh, rooted in uh, social anthropology and human geography. So uh, it will mm, be this sort of 
more individual and more social cultural uh, approach uh, to the to the waterways so when in the first um, lecture dr uh, patrick martel was was also talking about this hydrosocial cycle so my my presentation will more deal with this sort of social side of the of the hydrosocial cycle and the main focus of, uh, of what I would like to talk about is uh, mobilities uh, on, on the canal, mobilities on the waterways, and also how these mobilities are governed uh, uh, at the moment. And uh, for me, this is um, the mobilities research uh, is what I have been doing uh, most uh, part uh, for the last um, five or six years. And as I see uh, the waterways as places, I think uh, mobility is, is one of those uh, key elements of what uh, makes a place a place and, and, and what, uh, what makes a, a canal a place. So just to give you um, a short background, the Canal and River uh, Inland Waterways Network in the in the UK is uh, quite big, uh, so five uh, more, more than five thousand kilometers of navigable waterways, three thousand kilometers of non-navigable uh, waterways. On the map here, you can see the network um, of uh, England and Wales, and. Uh, I, I have left uh, Scotland out because my research is focusing on England and Wales, mostly uh, northwest and uh, uh, northwest England and and northern uh, Wales. And to give you a very short uh, historical overview, of course, the waterways, the rivers, natural waterways have been basis for uh, internal transport uh, already in the uh, pre-industrial times. However, the river can be uh, fairly uh, unreliable because you need uh, the river needs to be dredged. The rivers are prone to uh, flooding. Sometimes there is not enough water in a river. And for these transport purposes, uh, the canals uh, were built. The first canal in the UK was built in, uh, uh, well, the first canal independent of, uh, totally independent of rivers or other waterways was built in 1761. And that was the Bridgewater Canal. But of course, before that, there were already uh, canals that were just connecting other, other wa waterways. So some important canals uh, from the earlier period would be St. Key Canal, Exeter Canal. And of course, uh, throughout the history, the canals have always been built for various purposes. Already in, um, uh, in, in ancient Rome, uh, uh, in ancient Egypt, the uh, canals were built for um, uh, for mostly irrigation, but later uh, also uh, uh, transport. So one of the first important canals was built in, in China, for instance, for instance uh, a contour transport canal that was uh, uh, following the, 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 the landscape. However, coming back to Britain, uh, already a hundred years before in the France, for instance, important canals had been built. However, this, this first important transport canal in the UK, Bridgewater Canal, really started what is called uh, now uh, the Canal Age of Britain, but it also kick-started the Industrial Revolution in Britain. And for this purpose, it was very, very uh, important development uh, in the history of the United Kingdom, but also in the history of the of the whole whole world. And uh, canals were used to transport uh, the raw materials, the coal needed to run the the various uh, factories and mills. They were used to transport the finished product. Um, transport on canals was so much. Uh, more efficient, easy, and much more quicker than on the roads uh, at that time. And, uh, and therefore, a lot of uh, canals in the UK were built 
and part of this can so-called canal age was also a time which was called the canal mania where a lot of uh, canals were built and uh, they were mostly uh, private uh, they, they were not owned by state, but they were owned by the private canal companies. And so it was a kind of, the canal mania time was like a, like a dot-com bubble in, 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 the, in the early uh, noughties, end of 19, uh, 90s, uh, in our age, because a canal, if you built a canal, it could make you very rich, but it could also, you could also lose uh, all of your money. So they were very, very uh, important. Uh, 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 constructions and it is also important to keep in mind that uh, the way that the canals were viewed uh, has uh, has differed uh, over the time uh, from their from their construction onwards so when the canals were built they were seen as the triumph of man over nature, triumph of human over, over nature. And they were seeing these wonders of construction and the feats of civil engineering uh, on the one hand. And as you can see, I've, I've quoted here this, um, this uh, letter from a, from a reader to the, to the local Manchester newspaper from the 18th century. And the reader says, I have lately been viewing the artificial wonders of London, but none gave me so much pleasure as the Duke of Bridgewater's navigation, the, uh, by which uh, he means the Bridgewater Canal. Uh, and here on this, on this watercolor, you can see the um, uh, aqueduct, uh, because the Bridgewater Canal has to cross the River Irwell, and so they uh, had to build a, an aqueduct. Uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, aqueduct uh, does not exist anymore, it is demolished because um, in the end of the 19th century, uh, uh, Manchester Ship Canal was built. Here you can see that uh, the, the, the aqueduct goes over River Irwell, but part of River Irwell was canalized and, and then uh, the the bridge had to, the aqueduct had to be destroyed so that demolished so that the, the ships could uh, go uh, through. And nowadays, uh, uh, instead, is the uh, one of the few uh, functioning uh, um, swing aqueducts uh, uh, in the world. So, if necessary for the for the larger ship to go on the Manchester Ship Canal, uh, the the swing aqueduct uh, can just uh, move and the ships uh, can go through. However, well, while some people were considering the canals as this sort of uh, wondrous achievements, uh, some people also thought about them as, as ugly, as constructed. Uh, the nickname of the canals, which is used until this day, is the cut. And this is because the canals were literally cut into the earth and not all people uh, found uh, that uh, beautiful. And as you will see later, this is a kind of interesting uh, parallel or, ju or juxtaposition because uh, nowadays the canals are kind of seen as the epitome of, of nature. So that these meanings have, have constantly uh, changed. Those canals were uh, built by uh, by uh, workmen who were called the navvies. Uh, navvies are short from the navigator. And when the canals were finished, uh, uh, these uh, workers, uh, often migrant workers uh, from, um, from Ireland often, who, who moved to where work was, and when the work was completed, they, they moved away and it, they led a very uh, mobile uh, life. And when those canals were completed, they often just uh, stayed on uh, to the canal and uh, they started working as, um, on the boats, uh, transporting the cargo. And so a very specific community developed on the canals, uh, which uh, was called the boat people. Uh, the whole families were living on board of these boats. As you can see, uh, these uh, are called the narrow boats. And they also lived a very uh, nomadic life, constantly in movement, constantly in mobility, uh, 
traveling on the boats carrying the cargo, uh, traveling on the, on the canal network, and they were born uh, on these boats, they lived their lives on the boats and, and also they died on these uh, boats. And again, because of the nature of, uh, of their life, this sort of life of constant mobility, they were seen as a sort of perpetual other of the British uh, society. And uh, uh, they were often treated suspiciously, um, uh, in the 19th century, just, uh, peop uh, many people often wrote that they don't go to church, etc. Uh, they don't put their children in school. However, of course, they could not do that because they they uh, they were constantly moving. So when the Sunday arrived and they were supposed to go to church, they were somewhere where there were no churches, etc., etc. So uh, it was a very specific uh, uh, community. Uh, that uh, developed uh, uh, on on the on the canal, and also uh, they were very interesting in their sort of challenging these uh, notions of uh, of uh, of uh, of Britishness or gender, in, uh, for instance, because uh, uh, the very often. Uh, uh, after the husband died, the uh, the wife took over the the boat and ran the boat, and it and was running it as sort of like a like a small small company. Uh, and just to introduce you, this main boat on on the canals on this uh, because most of these canals are are narrow. Only this Manchester Ship Canal, which I showed before, is one of the few ones that is a larger canal that can accommodate uh, also seagoing ships. But most of these boats um, are maximum um, 72 uh, foot uh, long, uh, six, foot, uh, 6 foot 10 uh, wide, so they are very narrow, they are long, they're not big. And nowadays uh, they do not uh, carry cargo anymore, but they are mostly uh, uh, redesigned for uh, leisure purposes. So you have both the old boats that have been converted into leisure boats, but also uh, new uh, boats are being built uh, for, for these purposes. However, this sort of golden age of the canals did not last very long because uh, the decline of the canal started in the 19th century as and as you can all already imagine the reason for that was of course the uh, introduction of the railways uh, to uh, Britain uh, already in the 1830s and throughout this, uh, this uh, century uh, the canals were used uh, less and less for transport and by the time uh, of the mid 20th century, many of these canals were already uh, absolutely derelict. They were full of rubbish. They were seen as as dangerous, and and definitely uh, sort of spaces and places that uh, that were uh, unwanted and uh, and. Uh, not favored uh, by the uh, local, either local residents or the uh, city planners. However, uh, now coming to the contemporary times, how did this uh, life cycle of the waterways uh, change? Um, in 1946, Inland Waterways Association was established. Uh, it was a volunteer organization that wanted to promote the canals and also um, promote their usage for both transport as well as, as leisure. Uh, the canals that had been all in the private uh, ownership were now uh, nationalized after the Second World War and uh, British uh, Waterways uh, uh, was established a government organization responsible for the maintenance of, of, the, of them. Uh, in 2012, uh, this government body was rearranged into a charity uh, now called uh, Canal and River Trust. 
and it is responsible for around two thirds of the waterways in the UK. Uh, the rest are under uh, different other uh, navigational authorities. One of the bigger ones is uh, still a government organisation, Environment Agency. However, the canals in Scotland are, are under the care of the Scottish canals, uh, still a government body. And nowadays, uh, pretty, uh, the Canal and River Trust uh, uh, is the main navigation authority. It's responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of these canals, but it also very heavily promotes these canals uh, for uh, leisure, tourism, as well as um, for general uh, well being. And so let's take a look of who are these people on the canals and uh, the main users of the canals in a way, people who, who are using the canals for what they were intended, for what they were built for, uh, the boaters. It's not a very big um, activity in the sense that uh, here we have this data from 2018 and it is uh, less than 1% of the British population who participates in the canal boating activities. Uh, however, there was a big increase in, in 2018, uh, which can have uh, different, uh, different reasons. Uh, th this study does, did not quote uh, what these reasons were for such a big increase. We can only speculate, and I have discussed this with, with um, others as well, that uh, uh, one element could be the very uh, warm summer of 2018. And also, uh, when I talk to the uh, companies, the higher boat uh, companies, they, they also have agreed that uh, uh, it's partly because of the uh, promotion of the canals on the various TV programs. So in recent, I would say, five to ten years, there has been a steady um, influx of new TV programs about the canal history, about the canal life, and this, this has made the canals um, more uh, popular. And as you can see from these numbers, uh, this group of canal boaters is fairly homogeneous. So they are mostly older, they are white British, uh, there are also uh, more uh, uh, men, there are also more men than women participating in this activity. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, homogeneous uh, group. And of course we can look at these uh, numbers and we can see from the statistics that these are the people who spend their time on the canals. However, my research was to find out that, okay, now that we know who are these people, uh, I would like to ask the questions, but why are they on the canals and what are they doing there? Because this is what you, what the, the service have not found out. And as I mentioned before, my background is more in, in anthropology and, and human geography. So my uh, data collection has uh, mostly uh, been uh, through uh, participant observation and uh, ethnographic uh, interviews, but also um, autoethnography, which is a sort of um, uh, more self-reflexive account of uh, understanding and analyzing and researching yourself uh, on the on the field and your changing relationships on the field. Uh, so in terms of participant observation, I um, took um, uh, different uh, boat uh, trips uh, lasting from a few hours to several days. I also did a lot of volunteering uh, on the canals, um, both uh, doing maintenance work, uh, volunteering um, uh, at canal festivals, volunteering at the CRT office. Uh, so whenever possible, I also attended various events and um, uh, forums organized by the navigation uh, authorities. And, uh, um, 
I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with this uh, uh, method. So you basically you attend, you become part of the group, and you uh, make uh, field field notes. Uh, I also conducted uh, several interviews um, with uh, different holiday boaters, but also after my uh, and my uh, some of my colleagues' interests turned. Uh, wider onto the different canal users, we also uh, conducted a focus group uh, interview with not just with boaters, but with different canal users. And this is the data. So now coming to the uh, waterway uh, as a place. Uh, so the way that I see or conceptualize uh, waterway uh, as a place is that the rivers or the canals are these linear entities and very often they are seen as uh, connecting places and the reason why the canals were constructed was that obviously they were literally built to connect one uh, town or one city to another to enable transport. However, the waterways do not only connect places but they themselves are also places, as I see them. And so they are these linear uh, places, uh, uh, sort of social natural hybrids, parts of this hydro hydrosocial uh, cycle, and the key elements of which, what makes this place a place, uh, as I see it, is uh, the mobilities, the materialities, the material properties, as well as the convivialities or the, or the soci sociabilities that uh, take place uh, on, these, uh, on these waterways. And the way I also see the canal is that, or the, or the river, or the or, uh, canalized river, is that it is a very interesting, both as case study, but also as a conceptual way of understanding the world around us because they are helping us to overcome these sort of boundaries and dichotomies. On the other hand, very often rivers and canals or waterways are boundaries themselves as well. They serve as boundaries and they help to overcome boundaries such as, for instance, natural and constructed because on a, on a waterway, be it a canal or a river, it's very difficult to pinpoint where does the natural end and the constructed start. Also rural and urban because um, the uh, canals uh, go through uh, different landscapes and cityscapes and they can be simultaneously uh, rural and urban and they also help us to somehow either overcome or to just look, get a different perspective to this sort of waterland um, uh, dichotomy. And quoting um, uh, uh, Benjamin Bowles uh, and others, uh, these waterways can sort of be seen as presenting a direct challenge to this sort of terra-centric understanding of world. So from the water, land is seen as the other and not vice versa so the water from if we look from the water it is the water that is the normality and land is seen as something different so let's look these mobilities that are so important to the canal as a as a place and when we talk about uh, le leisure and tourism then there are a few key elements here that I have um, identified in my research. So why do these people spend time on the canals? One important element is this notion of history and, and industrial heritage. That the canals are heritage spaces and there is they themselves are heritage constructions. They go through a lot of uh, places and spaces, uh, the sort of industrial landscapes. They pass uh, mills and uh, factories, some of which are still uh, in use uh, for industrial purposes, 
some have been um, converted uh, to um, uh, to dwelling for dwelling uh, for residential use some are abandoned and so the way that boaters see it is this this canal is enabling them this sort of trip through the history of Britain and very often it is uh, uh, connected with a certain nostalgia for the past, nostalgia for the times where uh, Britain was a country of big industry and, and industrial development and, and, and many of the British tourists sort of hark back to this kind of um, era. But it's not just sort of abstract understanding or even just symbolic understanding or thinking about this history. What the boaters find very important as well is this embodied engagement with uh, heritage transport and infrastructure. Uh, in the UK, the canals, this, uh, these narrow canals are operated basically as they were 200 years ago. So the boaters themselves have to operate these locks, as you can see in the picture, the woman is pushing the lock gate open so that the boat uh, could uh, leave uh, the lock. And it is very important to, for them to be able to perform these same practices with their whole bodies and then experience something that again links uh, them uh, with these uh, boaters uh, from a few uh, hundred years ago. Another important moment for the tourist is that the canals, they seek the canals as natural environment. They, they do not see canals necessarily as constructed, but they also see them as these blue and green corridors in the cities. They see them as, uh, as an opportunity to see uh, different uh, animals, birds and, and, uh, and plants. Uh, several of them protected species, several of them uh, those that they normally don't see in their everyday lives. However, the last is actually I left uh, what I find is one of the most important one uh, for the boating tourists is the slow tempo. So this experience of boating tourism is determined by the speed limit of the canal boat um, which is four mi miles per hour, uh, 6.5 kilometers per hour. So it's a, it's a steady walking pace. You can, um, you can walk uh, faster easily uh, than, than, than the canal boat. And this physical slow tempo of mobility for these boaters translates into a kind of slower pace of life and Ben Bowles has, uh, has discussed this in his work on uh, London liverboard boaters as the boat time. And this boat time is both personal and political at the same time. So on one hand, the boaters see this slow, so slow boating tempo as something that enables them to live a different kind of life or from the tourist perspective, to participate in this slow tourism activities. Um, and just to wind down, to step out of this sort of uh, uh, modern world of timetables and, and nine to five working patterns, et cetera, et cetera, and enables this sort of greater freedom. It is, of course, an interesting uh, uh, topic to discuss in terms of whether now these things have started to change because of the global pandemic and not just for the canal boaters or, or, that, or other uh, people who live lives of mobility, these sort of barriers have, have started to, these boundaries have started to blur as well, what is home, what is, what is work, etc, etc. Um, but also these boaters, uh, especially the liverboard boaters, see this boat time as also a certain political statement or like a counter activity to this sort of constant control of the state. 
And also they kind of construct this sort of their way of life as more uh, natural, connected to the nature, uh, because of this slowness and because uh, the, the boats, uh, they, they, they have to think about things like where do you get the water, pumping the water, getting the water, pumping out the toilets, uh, making sure that you have electricity, etc., etc. So um, this again presents us with a very interesting sort of juxtaposition because on the one hand many boaters see their activity as uh, very sustainable and ecological, close to nature. However, on the other hand, uh, most of these boats run on diesel engines, which is obviously not very uh, sustainable. So again, these sort of interesting parallels. And this slow tempo brings us to the other mobilities that happen on the canal. Because it's not just the boaters who use this space. Canals are actually this sort of multi-user, multi-mobility, and therefore also multi-tempo spaces. In addition to the boaters on the canals, you will find on the towpaths, which used to be used by the horses towing the boats, but now these are often very well used urban and also rural uh, shortcuts, uh, thoroughfares, um, uh, nice routes where there are there is no uh, no motorized traffic. And when you have these very different um, uh, users, you have, as you can see on this picture, you have someone who is running, someone who is walking, you have the cyclist, and this creates a sort of potential for either tension or conflict. And as I have quoted here from an interview, uh, a boater uh, who says, you shout slow down at everybody, slow down to the cyclists, to the dog walkers, to the other boats going past, who are kind of inching past your boat. And here he's kind of reflecting on this, on this tension between the boaters and other users, but this, but, but, but he's being very reflexive about it and a, a little bit ironical as well, because he, what he essentially says is that it's not just all the other users, it's also, also the other boaters. So uh, in a way, it, we, can, we can draw a parallel with, with, with tourism here, where it's a, a fairly known sort of um, trope or maybe even cliche in, in tourism uh, studies or st in tourism that Every, every tourist really does not want other tourists in these tourist uh, uh, locations and, and spaces. It's this uh, eternal um, conundrum of the, of the tourist. Uh, but it's not just the boaters who have a certain tension with uh, all the other uh, canal users, because it's important to keep in mind that all these groups have very varied and different um, worldviews and outlooks and understandings of the canal as a place among these groups as well. So here's, uh, here's a quote from a cyclist uh, who says, at seven o'clock, you just get these middle-aged men in Lycra. So imagine all these people who have got really wealthy houses, they've spent 3,000 uh, pounds on their fancy bikes, and I'm still there on my touch style high nelly. I don't like cycling that fast on the canals because I like to have a slow pace to enjoy, see all the stuff that's around. I chose to go on the canal because I chose to go slower to get to where I want to. And again, this is very interesting to see that here we have this cyclist who have also adopted this certain uh, um, ideology or this value system of the canal which is that it's a slow place and you have to uh, you have to adopt to this uh, to this uh, special slow uh, 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 tempo of of that this uh, is characterizing uh, this place and then of course it um, brings a question of 
we have a place like that characterized by a specific tempo yet also characterized by a very very different users and very different usages who all have their particular tempos so how do you go about governing these uh, these mobilities and when dr martel in the first lecture was talking about uh, governmentality then when we talk about mobility the notion of government mobility actually has grown out of this notion of governmentality and so this is essentially about this sort of biopolitics of mobility making people govern themselves and coping with uncertainties through this mobility uh, so let's see how this happens or how this is done on the on the waterways so these all these different mobilities that uh, i was talking about and here you have very different understandings of of what they mean and how they are practiced on the canal so you you have on the one hand this uh, uh, cyclist says you know canals of space it's a lord of the flies with the grumpy boat people giving it out to the cyclist this sort of mobility conflict this tension that happens here on the other hand you have this quote from the boater who says the canal has always been a linear village or connections with people it's a family so a very special kind of place with its own value system with its own tempo uh, and and as we can see from these two different quotes there there is a, a certain uh, tension lying there now when we think about the uh, navigation authority uh, the canal and river trust the way that they have governed these mobilities and govern uh, on, on the canal they have tried a very different approaches so for instance when we talk about the usage of the canal tow paths then in the 1980s they trialed for instance uh, uh, permits for the cyclists so the cyclists were not allowed to even go on the tow path uh, without the uh, without the special permit uh, this was discontinued uh, they have also tried um, speed limits that the, on the for the bikes that you should not go over certain certain um, uh, speed again this was discontinued because the moment you uh, put uh, more strict rules in place you also have to kind of police these rules or make sure that uh, that these are uh, followed these rules how do you control the uh, um, the following of these rules and so in a way the CRD has taken a step back and instead of asking for permits and, and, and giving speed limits to the cyclists, they're sort of taking this view of the mo different mobility users to sort things out between themselves. And of course there is a certain hierarchy on the canal when it comes to mobilities. So, for instance, uh, everybody knows or they will learn uh, through the process of using these canals that, for instance, uh, boats and boaters would have priority. And when it comes to the boats themselves, then working boats would have uh, priority over the, uh, over the uh, uh, leisure boats or private boats. Uh, and there is also a specific canal etiquette like what a, how do you how do you behave when two boats are coming to the lock um, wanting to go through one from the one side another from the other side how do you determine who has the right to go first um, and uh, and so this is something that a beginner boater has to learn in throughout the practice they, they might not know that you know what is the proper etiquette that it is not the one who 
arrives on the lock first, but it, it's actually the one who, uh, for whom the lock is in their favor, which means that if you are able to go into the lock without filling uh, or emptying it from the water, of the water, then it is your uh, um, right to go into the lock. And it does not matter if, uh, if uh, the other one arrived to the lock uh, first. So this sort of etiquette has just developed through the usage on the canal. And what the CRT is doing is that they are just using certain nudge tactics and just trying to um, convince people to behave in certain manner in their mobilities to reduce these mobility conflicts. Because again, the, the main mobility conflicts are about the tempo and uh, they're mostly about uh, uh, cyclists being perceived as, as too uh, fast on the towpath. So the uh, Canal and River Trust has these campaigns, uh, as you can see here, this sort of sleeping policeman uh, uh, 3D um, uh, uh, a picture on the put on the towpath, uh, uh, drop, saying drop your drop your pace. They also had this campaign where they uh, got some duck actors and they painted uh, duck lanes on the towpaths and they said, well, uh, we have uh, everyone is uh, we we are all sharing the space on the canals. Uh, people and tax alike, and now uh, they had, and then they had this campaign, and 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 it was picked up by several um, uh, newspapers around the world. And again, it um, on the one hand it promotes the canals themselves as spaces for well-being, it draws attention to the canals, but it also promotes this uh, CRT um, um, uh, message uh, message of uh, of. Uh, uh, share the space, uh, drop your pace, it's a special place. So essentially, this sort of uh, strat strategy of uh, governing these mobilities on a canal is quite similar to these uh, shared space uh, planning schemes, which have been used in uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, countries uh, around the world, where you knowingly remove all these mobility regulations from a space. So uh, here, as you can see, this quote from Hamilton Bailey, all the former standardized priority markings and highway curbs were removed to be replaced by a simple paved square on a slightly raised platform, recalling its history as the focal point of the head of an ancient canal system. Cars, bicycles, trucks, pedestrians, wheelchair users negotiate their way across the space, employing an intricate and unspoken set of protocols reminiscent of the ice skating rink. Uh, this uh, quote is about uh, a, a Dutch town called uh, Osterwolde, uh, but um, I put the picture of, of, uh, of a point in town called, uh, in, the, in the UK uh, as one example of this, uh, of this uh, scheme. And of course, um, there has all also been uh, quite a bit of research done about uh, this sort of uh, shared space uh, notion in context with um, uh, uh, traffic reg and mobility regulations in India, because there there is this sort of kind of, in some places you can see this sort of hybrid between this sort of uh, shared space uh, uh, notion and also the, the, the some uh, like regulated traffic and the sort of hybrid has uh, like, because this, you can have these rules, but sometimes the practice, the lived reality just takes over. Uh, however, this sort of uh, designated shared space uh, scheme, it just uh, removes all these rules altogether. And it basically says, you have this space, just work it out uh, among yourselves. Because it, the notion behind it is that if you do not have any rules, written rules, it's not certain that chaos will ensure after that, uh, because this um, comparison with the ice skating rink is very relevant. Like if you put these different people with very different um, abilities of skating, some are beginners, some are very professional, you put them all in this one ice skating rink, these people wearing these you know, sharp plates on their shoes, 
with very different tempos and somehow it always works out some sort of um, rules kick in and people just work it uh, out between themselves so a question is could these sort of shared space schemes or could this sort of approach to this uh, mobility as a shared space as something that needs to be negotiated that can be negotiated if you just give people sort of greater freedom and agency to negotiate these these mobility problems and, and and tensions and conflicts so if you if you take this approach instead of giving them these strict rule based uh, systems maybe this is a better way of of um, of governing and and approaching uh, to uh, to mobility and maybe we can use this sort of um, uh, either shared space schemes or uh, what goes on on the canal towpaths, this mobility nego nego negotiation, or also this sort of uh, what, uh, what, how the um, uh, lived reality of traffic is sometimes uh, playing out in, in, in various uh, Indian uh, intersections in, in urban areas. Maybe we can take this approach and use it to uh, govern also other spaces and of course we have to think about here the sort of caveats or what kind of problems it also uh, can bring because again it's it was quite uh, obvious from dr uh, martel's uh, previous lecture as well that when we talk about government mentality it is not something that is necessarily positive all the time that it has this, you know, when we talk about this regulation and self-regulation and self-governing and this sort of biopolitics, it also has uh, its dark side, obviously, and and similarly to these uh, governing mobilities in the in the in this in this multi-tempo shared spaces. And and one thing to really think about it is that uh, uh, if you have um, um, modes of mobility that are very unequal then this obviously can uh, can cause problems so um, from uh, my research on the canal towpaths it seems that it's um, it works better when these uh, mobility actants are um, uh, relatively equal because in other spaces uh, it, it's quite clear that for instance if you have in these uh, shared space schemes if you have too many cars then those um, uh, those uh, users who are weaker, like such as pedestrians, especially older pedestrians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they feel uh, uh, they they don't feel safe and they don't want to use these uh, mobility spaces. So there is a there, there is that point. And I put this um, a reference here, uh, this paper that. Um, uh, my colleagues and I have written about this sort of uh, sharing this uh, mobility and govern governing the mobilities, uh, especially on the waterways. So you can you can find it. It's a, it's an open access uh, uh, paper. If you if you are interested in finding out more about this idea. And so I will just uh, finish with uh, throwing uh, into the air some questions about. Uh, what will happen now with the with this sort of a shared mobility and shared space on this on these canals because these tow paths are narrow so it's a fairly constricted space on the one hand during this pandemic this uh, opportunity to go outside outdoors enjoy this uh, space that is free to use heritage spaces uh, green and, and blue corridors in the urban areas as well. Uh, very important and uh, and very uh, uh, very welcome for many people. The usage of the canals uh, grew uh, during the pandemics. Also now in this summer, the, because the people cannot uh, obviously travel anymore, in, international tourism has gone down. Uh, domestic tourism has grown. Uh, so people were more and more uh, hiring those boats to go on holiday. So, uh, so that uh, uh, development also happened. 
uh, also because of the pandemic, as we all have moved into the digital space, the canal uh, uh, also has to become more and more digital and more information has to be on online and uh, 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 whether it's uh, an online lecture about the history of the canal or uh, an, an online uh, tour that you can take uh, on a canal. But it also brings new problems. So, for instance, um, in this pandemic situation, where in the age of social distancing, how do you make sure that social distancing is maintained? Is it even possible to maintain it? Uh, and, and if we try to maintain it, who has the priority? Uh, because there are very different groups, such as people who live on board of the boats, uh, and then, on the other hand, you have these people who want to uh, come uh, onto the waterway and in enjoy this uh, open space. Uh, so, this is it uh, from me. Here are the, some of the references that I used. And um, uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Maria. And uh, that's a completely different uh, terrain that uh, many of us are into with the talk. And thank you very much for that. And uh, we will uh, straight away get into the interactors, which uh, come as uh, uh, chats. And uh, I shall read uh, the messages in there for you. So if you could, uh, uh, can you address it one by one? Can I quote them? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll go first to the first question. It's from Maliha Rahimi. She asks, from economic point of view, how these waterways act? Are they a part of UK government income? Thank you. That's Maliha Rahimi. Yes, thank you. Uh, so majority of the canals are not owned by uh, the government anymore. Uh, so in 2012, uh, when this government organization, uh, British Waterways, uh, was replaced uh, by Canal and River Trust, is, uh, which is a charity. And so they gave the canals into the ownership of this charity. And as a part of this um, sort of um, trans transitional period, they, uh, they gave um, uh, government grants for a fixed number of years. I think it could have been like 10 or 15 years fixed income to the CRT from the government. And, and after that, it's basically this charity has to become uh, self-reliant and self-sufficient. Uh, and, and they, of course, can apply for different grants, both from government and elsewhere. Uh, for instance, many uh, canals have been restored using various uh, uh, lottery grants in the UK. But the assumption is that after this transition period, the, um, they have to be uh, self-sufficient uh, and earn their own income. And, and yes, so they function as, as navigation authorities. They, uh, they take license uh, fees from the boaters. If you are a boater on the canal, you have to pay for the license. Uh, also, uh, license fees from the people um, using them uh, to uh, canoe or kayak so so that so they have that so they have also these donations they have the grants they have um, their own um, um, a property along the canals so they also get money from um, uh, from uh, uh, sometimes selling or also like renting out these properties but yes the basic is that they have to be this uh, canal driver trust has to be a self uh, has to become a self-sufficient Thank you, uh, Maria. And if I may go to the next question. Mm -hmm. It's from uh, Professor KMC. Canals in many parts of the world are susceptible to pollution of different kinds, from industries to tourism. 
construction activities, etc. What is the situation in the UK given the high density of international tourists over the years? Do the migrants from other countries, particularly from the erstwhile East Europe, make a living out of canal tourism? That's Professor KMC. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, question. And um, yeah, and you have touched upon uh, a lot of very, very interesting, uh, interesting topics here. So uh, I will go um, one uh, topic uh, after uh, another. So yes, the pollution uh, from the environmental perspective, yes, uh, it uh, definitely is and also has been a big problem on the canals. So of course, taking now a step back to the history, the canals used to be extremely polluted water course, courses because they were, they were not just used to transport uh, goods along this, uh, from one factory to, 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 to somewhere, but uh, the canals were also literally used, all this sort of waste uh, went into the canal. So the canals were very, very heavily polluted because all these industries along the canal were used to pollute these canals. And over the years, this of, of course has changed and, and when we talk now about the 20th century and especially uh, second half of the 20th century onwards, um, as the canals have been, many canals have been restored and and as they have become more and more these tourism and leisure spaces, uh, they have become more and more clean and they have, they have more and more environmental uh, regulations. Uh, so, for instance, uh, water in several canals. For, in, for instance, near Manchester, there is one one canal, uh, one part actually of the of this Bridgewater Canal, this first canal I, I, I talked about earlier. Uh, the color of the water is orange. It's basically orange, and the reason for that is that the water is polluted by the nearby iron uh, nearby mines, and the iron ore is coming into the water. And this, of course, has effect on the on the both flora and fauna in, uh, on, uh, on this ecological uh, situation on the on the canal. And this these things have been something that, um, of course, uh, thanks to the European Union and the regulations, um, uh, many of these canals have been cleaned. The water has been cleaned, and I have even myself been in the in the central Manchester uh, with some uh, chemistry students who were conducting experiments uh, and um, basically uh, measuring the, uh, the, the, the pollution levels and doing some experiments with the, with the canal water. And they actually said that this water now is, is very clean. It was surprisingly clean. Uh, and they said that it's fine, you know, for the fish and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's also like circling back to this sort of uh, social aspect. It's very interesting because, of course, the canal, it's still water and there is a lot of sediment in the water. So the urban canal water is, um, is it's, it's gray, it's, um, it's, uh, it, yeah, it, so it's, 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 it's not an attractive water. It's not clear blue water. So people see it and often perceive it as, as contaminated or polluted, whereas it actually is not. However, I have spoken with some people about that, that orange canal near, near Manchester. And even though that canal is polluted, many people don't perceive it as polluted because they see it as this beautiful orange color water. And, they, and some people were actually quite upset that um, when, um, when um, the projects came along to start cleaning it because they 
uh, for them it was this sort of canal of, of their childhood, this orange canal of water. So there are there are very very interesting tensions that uh, that uh, that uh, that happen because of these 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 environmental issues, and of course this very very important challenge is uh, about the contemporary canals is that the canal boats as i mentioned before they they are polluting they run on diesel uh, they have diesel engines they run on diesel and it's not just the diesel it's this red diesel which is very even more polluting and and again some boaters have these uh, notions about again the eu regulations wanting to ban this um, this this red uh, diesel and of course the uh, there are also certain re requirements like for instance if you are a canal boater you are you should not um, put um, uh, non sustainable like um, washing up liquid you should not use non sustainable uh, non ecological washing up liquid for instance because the washing up water on the boat goes straight into the canal uh, the toilet goes uh, into a separate tank and has to be disposed of, but the water goes straight into the canal. So these kinds of things are important. And now, and, uh, more and more, when I talk to the canal hire boat companies, then um, uh, the future everybody uh, understands is the electric boats. But there are only very, very, very few electric boats on the on the canals nowadays. And also, uh, uh, there is not yet this infrastructure because if you have the electric boat you have to have the um, the, the the charging points etc etc uh, so that's that's this sort of interesting uh, element of about the, the the environment and the pollution that and again it sort of relates back to this uh, notion about the canal to nature being on the canal as more sustainable because it has, it is complicated. It, it is not unproblematic. Let's put it that way. Um, about tourism and and uh, tourism from other countries, I think one um, property of this canal tourism is um, that it is actually fairly British centered. So. In all my field, during all my field work on, on the canals, I have very, very rarely met uh, people, international tourists on the, on the canals. They're mostly British domestic tourists. And when I have met uh, international tourists, they are, they are often um, from Australia, from Canada. So like Commonwealth countries, Anglo-American sort of, um, so I have seen less uh, less people, say for instance, continental Europe. And yeah, when it and when it comes to the um, uh, to the to the Eastern Eastern European element, well, there certainly is at least one Eastern European canal researcher. That's me researching these canals. But when it comes to um, who is owning the, uh, for instance, canal tourism companies and who is running those, it is it is. I have only seen uh, British people because it's kind of also seen, it, it goes back to this sort of historical and heritage and nostalgia and it is seen as some something very, very British. Uh, but of course, um, it differs in, differs in different places because, for instance, in London, uh, the setup is more international and there you have more people living, or, or for instance, on canal boats and they are from all over the world and all over the Europe, including Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. And in London also there are certain tensions because um, uh, the canals are there perceived as being too con con congested, there are too many boats. Uh, some people who have lived on those boats for longer, they say that, that there are uh, too many newcomers, that they don't have space anymore, because a lot of people um, just also move to these boats when uh, because of it's cheaper. And so some people see that they don't relate to this, to this, to this proper slow living ideology of the canals. Again, it can be very, very contested. So lots of interesting issues there. Thank you, uh, Maria. And uh, if I may go to the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Abhinand Kishore. Are there cases of floods in these places? If yes, 
how does it affect the inhabitants and what are the kind of responses to climate what is the social background of the inhabitants within brackets and also those people who makes a living out of tourism and related businesses bracket close of these places yes uh, yes, uh, floods, uh, again, excellent question, because um, it's actually some, and, and of course, um, uh, there is flooding that happens, it affects uh, both the rivers and also the canals, and, um, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it was in 2015, uh, around Christmas, where uh, the north of England was um, suffered under very, very, very heavy flooding and it caused a lot of problems and also so the rivers were flooding and that of course also then flood, flooded the canals and many boats were displaced, some boats drowned and as you saw on those pictures if many people live on those boats and you know it's it's not an easy task when you have to like your whole home has drowned and then the refloating these boats is is expensive and and difficult and also the floods uh, caused um, these breaches on the canal and and that caused a lot of problems for the for the for the canal and river trust uh, uh, because all all this had to be repaired, all this had to be restored, it and it took uh, uh, a big amount of their um, of their of their budget uh, uh, dealing with the, with the aftermath of this um, of this uh, of this flood, and of course for the local inhabitants, not just the people who live on the canal, but uh, but the people who who lived in those places that were actually flooded and the water levels uh, went uh, very very high in some areas in in the north of england and uh, and homes and houses were were flooded uh, and this obviously caused 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 a big issue and big uh, and big problems for these in inhabitants and uh, the responses have been um, uh, uh, varied, uh, but one response that I can I can say is that um, it saw this sort of emergence of the local activism. And of course, flooding is not something new to in in England, and it happens from time to time. And it also brings with it all sorts of problems. For instance, there are some. Um, places where it is almost difficult where, where it is very very difficult because it's very expensive for you to insure your house because the the payments are just too too, too big and this is because the area is uh, is uh, considered as high risk flooding area so you cannot even insure your insure your house and there have been uh, uh, cases of um, of uh, of, of irresponsible planning and and development, where where houses have been built on the floodplains, and again this causes a lot of problems. But yes, uh, so after this big uh, Christmas Day flooding in 2015, several um, uh, local flood uh, flood resilience groups were were. Uh, were formulated and um, and I have been also working with some of them and uh, and for instance this one group that I that I know more they wanted to uh, they were flooded but the people in this group uh, they lived in the area but they were not flooded themselves and they just wanted to help other people because when the flood happened they didn't know what to do they wanted to help but they didn't know what to do and where to start. So they understood that in order to do something, you need to have this sort of organization that next time when the flood happens, this is what we can do. And, uh, um, and, and, uh, and so this sort of local, local organization, community action, trying to build this resilience, uh, 
that that was um, uh, that was that that was one of the responses because again, like when we talk about flooding, I'm sure you know as well that you can't fight the flood. You know, you have to, you can't fight this water. You can't stop the the water. Uh, uh, very often, you just have to be resilient. You have to learn to live with the water, and this is something that these lo local communities uh, are trying to do. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, I have uh, got a couple of questions uh, in the phone, if I may uh, read those for you together. Um, the first one, you referred to the terra centrism of the modern nation state and that for the boat people, land is the other. Does their location liberate them from the fanaticism and hostilities associated with entrenched nationalism? That's the first question. If I may also read the second together. Okay. Are the water bodies in UK generally clean? Are they kept clean in civic consensus or by constant monitoring slash surveillance? Thank you. Uh, yes, I will first uh, answer to the second questions about uh, uh, keeping the waterways clean. Yes. They are kept uh, clean, uh, they are monitored, there are regulations about what you can and cannot do uh, with the water, as I was saying before as well about this, you know, what you can put into the water, etc, etc. Uh, there is, of course, uh, a lot of pollution still, I mean, again, as I mentioned before, those um, those uh, um, diesel, mo diesel engines are polluting and uh, um, and uh, etc. However, one of the very, very big and really pressing pollution issue on the canals and and rivers is the plastic pollution, and this is really, really a big problem in the in the UK. And um, and there have been many reports that um, that uh, draw attention to this problem, and. And, and of course, because, you know, if, if you have this, uh, you know, we know the hydrological cycle, you know, if it is in the river, if it is in the canal, it will end up in the sea. And, and, and this is a big, big problem. And one of the things that the Canal and River Trust is trying to do to, to fight this is that in addition to, the, uh, to their own uh, people working at the trust and, and just working on removing this uh, rubbish from the from the canals uh, they have also a very vast network of volunteers who all over the uk just go uh, uh, monthly sometimes maybe even weekly um, they have formed these local groups uh, some of these groups have the, what is called adoption, like they have adopted a stretch of canals. So they kind of like take this ownership of this space, that this is our local canal and we are taking care of it, we are keeping it clean. And myself also, as part of my field work, I have um, attended for years and years now on this monthly uh, cleanup um, uh, events where we... Uh, walk on the tow bath and just pick rubbish. Sometimes we have the, the work boat, so we are on the boat in the canal and just use these big nets to just fish out the rubbish uh, from the canals. And, and I think this is really important and mo much more should be done. And also I think you cannot rely on the volunteer labor only, but I think um, working together volunteers is still very, very important be just because of what I just said for this, uh, about this uh, this notion of uh, owning this space like it's important for the local people to see this canal it is it is a commons and they need to also and take care of it and 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 uh, this these volunteering opportunities help to establish this about this terror centrism and looking 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 out from the water to the to the land and um, and this sort of being um, viewing yourself as as opposed to or or different from 
this nation state, this constant state of surveillance, uh, wanting to be free from these um, um, this sort of capitalist um, uh, constrictions and timetables and schedules and notions and rules. Uh, it's it's a it's a very very good question, Matthew, because it's it's very problematic. Because on the one hand, I want to say yes, it does help to 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 look at this 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 question of of nation and and state. Otherwise, it it does, and many be and many voters do. On the other hand, however, the way I see it, as, as, and this is just my view, and uh, as, an, as maybe like an outsider research, uh, these canals and their history it, are very much intermingled with this sort of notions about, about the British history and the, the British industry and the, the greatness of the Britain and its, and, its, and its historical might and power as a as an industrial nation, and so there are very different elements there that all intertwine. And I guess you would have some voters who would view it in one way, some voters who have sort of who who who, who do believe and who have sort of who see themselves as opposed to this all this that I just mentioned. And on the other hand, I am sure that there are others who, who actually see this sort of being on the canal as, as a, some sort of continuation of this nostalgic idea of, uh, of, of British industrial, industrial greatness. So, yeah, it's um, there. Yeah. And, and, and I guess that is why I really, really love these canals and I really love doing research on them because it's like a microcosm of everything. Yeah, it's yeah. any topic you can you can think about, you will find on the canals. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Maria. I think, uh, yeah, there is one more question. So I'll just quote it for you. All right. Uh, this is Nikita. Nikita asks, who are the major users of these canals? Whether the local community have any control over these canals? How do the local community respond to changing use of canals and interventions of outsiders? That's Nikita. Thank you very much. Another another excellent question. And um, and uh, yes, so the major users are um, basically when we talk about geographical sense, uh, they would be mostly uh, local inhabitants. So you would be just people, if you live nearby the canal, and, uh, and, more, than, and more than half of uh, British population lives within five miles of a, of a waterway. Uh, so very often you use the canals and the canal dough baths for um, for commuting, walking to work, cycling to work. You use them for leisure, just for walking. You use uh, for walking. You use them for walking dogs, walking with your children. You use them as spaces um, just to go and have uh, lunch uh, in your lunch break. Uh, because, um, and this is something that a lot of research has, has shown over the years that uh, sort of psychologically or cognitively speaking, people are attracted to waterways. They are attracted to water. And, 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 and so, so also after these canals were restored and they were not perceived as, as polluted, ugly, dangerous spaces anymore like like they they were uh, maybe uh, 50 or 70 years ago uh, when they were in disrepair and and left derelict uh, then after that 
canals have been become more and more these sort of leisure spaces. Uh, however, I, when I say that, I don't want to say that all the canals are these beautiful, idyllic, uh, um, uh, utopian spaces of of natural beauty and and uh, and and heritage beauty. Again, it's canals are full of contradictions. Of course, you will find many urban spaces where the canals are still perceived as uh, as dangerous and um, and and scary. And again, it's just part of their 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 constant sort of dichotomy and and juxtapositions and 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 why they are so interesting. So yes, they are mostly used by the by the by the by the people living nearby the canals. And then they are used by these boaters, and some of these boaters just stay in one place, and they just are moored, and and they have this fixed mooring. But some of those boaters who live on the on the boats, uh, they um, keep uh, 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 moving on the canal network. Uh, they have a special license uh, called continuous cruisers. So again, their lives are very mobile, and then sort of like again relating back to this history of uh, of the boat people who live their lives on this perpetual mobility, transporting cargo, and many people who live uh, nowadays on these canals, they make this link, they construct this historical link, uh, regardless of whether they have actual family uh, family connections to these people uh, or not. It's um, it's something, uh, something, uh, yeah. Um, okay. And quickly about yeah, responding to the was it uh, responding to the changing uses uh, of the canals again. So yes, um, um, mostly in the UK, it is perceived, of course, as a good thing when a canal is restored and. And local people can in, enjoy them uh, because it, when you properly maintain the canal and and have air spaces and areas for people to sit, and when you make sure that there there isn't too much much rubbish, people start using them. But of course, there can be certain tensions because because, for instance. Uh, in the past 30 years, these waterfront redevelopments have um, sprung up everywhere uh, in the world, including in the UK. And so there are many, many places where by the canal side you have this residential development. These huge flats are being built up and always in these planning um, uh, applications and, and these um, plans, uh, it's always very beautiful with the beautiful waterway, with the beautiful, colorful boats, and and it's very uh, presented in a very idyllic um, manner. But however, it sometimes happens when these developments are built, then the boaters discover that there are no mooring spaces, so you cannot go there, uh, and you cannot even you can go just past. You cannot stop your boat because there there are no facilities for mooring. There are no rings. You, there there's nowhere to put your mooring pin. So again, this is this sort of neoliberal sort of appropriation of these spaces, which is which is not uh, which is not very nice. And uh, and again, sometimes you have that. Uh, these developments try to close certain spaces that suddenly people discover that what was before um, accessible to them to walk by the canal side or riverside, suddenly there is a big residential building with gates and you cannot go through it. So there are these uh, these problems and and of course uh, of course uh, people people don't uh, don't like that. Maria, uh, in fact, if you if you're okay, can we take one last question? And, of course, uh, of course. Yeah. So the the this question is from Arya Mohan. She asks, "Ma'am, did people where water people near waterways get opportunity to project their traditional heritage in tourism, as in the case of gondola boats in Italy?" 
Uh, thank you, and uh, this is also a very, 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 very good question. And um, and yes, uh, so these boats on the on the UK waterways, these narrow boats, um, uh, they are also like gondolas in Italy. These narrow boats are also very special from heritage point of view, because narrow boats are can uh, are boats specific to the british canals nowhere in the world they were developed on the british canals and and they are the sort of typical british boating heritage and and so they are important and for for many people for many boaters it's actually when i mentioned like the sort of hierarchies of of canal before i would say that when it comes to the boats on the top of the hierarchy is the um, as a residential boat is the is the old uh, traditional working uh, narrow boat uh, if you have that then you are on the on the on the on the on the top of boating hierarchy and uh, these boats uh, are mostly um, made of wood wooden boats and they are uh, very distinctly, um, they have this sort of very distinct, they are very colorful, they look very beautiful, and they are adorned with this a special type of art that the, the doors uh, to the, to the, uh, to the, in the, in the back and the, in the stern of the boat are uh, uh, often adorned with this uh, special uh, canal art, which is called the roses and castles. These very colorful, beautiful pictures uh, uh, painted on on the on these doors, and this is again this sort of traditional painting style of these particular boats. And so, again, this this kind of visual heritage, and this is very important for the for both the canal boaters themselves, but also the people who work in. Um, uh, in in uh, in the higher boat industry, and also the people who um, who run the uh, canal uh, and waterways museums, and who are responsible for for uh, for presenting uh, and representing uh, this heritage uh, to the to the potential uh, uh, visitors, and I'm uh, I'm really happy that you brought. Uh, uh, about these uh, traditional Italian boats, because I'm sure that one of the next uh, lectures will be by uh, Francesco Vicentin from Italy, and uh, I'm sure he will uh, talk about these traditional uh, Italian um, Italian um, uh, boats as well. So, uh, so thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Maria. And uh, there is an interesting comment to add on. Uh, which comes as a pointer to the comment, which says that don't forget feeding the ducks. Uh, <laughs> they won't, from, thank you. <laughs> that's from an unknown source. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, going through the socio-natural spaces, if I may put it so, and I mean, taking taking cues from like the, 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 the kind of informed project started by Lefebvre, carried on, carried on to Neil Smith and... Uh, people like that, but you're grounding it in a very interesting way in some of those everyday aspects of life, like tourism and, you know, and, and canals as they are networked into. And, um, and I think it's uh, more than relevant to the, the spaces that we are working at, where uh, the kind of hydro modernities that, uh, that are involved is, uh, is uh, it's taking different kinds of lives at present. I mean, the, where, where we met in Spain also it's, it happens to be a place where hydro modernities have such a tremendous uh, impact and now with unintended um, uh, designless uh, consequences or unintended designs in the making. So thank you very much Maria for adding on to our platform and uh, you've, you've been an apt speaker to come at this occasion. So, so I may ask Professor KMC to say a few words and then I will uh, close the session. Yes, thank you very much everyone. Thank you for inviting me and, and thank you for these excellent questions. I have really, really enjoyed discussing with you. Thank you, Maria. So, uh, thank you Dr. Maria. Yeah. So, uh, so with that, uh, we'll close this series, uh, this session in the series, and we'll have 
another one coming very soon hopefully with a filmmaker and uh, please uh, attend that session as well and this will eventually become a platform and maria uh, it will be great that uh, you are there with uh, us in our venture so uh, with that let me thank all our participants for the lovely interactions and uh, keen inquiries um, and uh, we are waiting for more interactors so with that this session is uh, coming to a close thank you once again all thank you matthew thank you all thank you professor